welcome and thank you for tuning in to Psychology Is. This is the 51st episode of this podcast. And as our longtime listeners are well aware, we cover a wide variety of topics. We speak to experts on various topics related to psychology, but we have paid special attention to <clears throat> the modern day practice of psychiatry and the profound problems at the heart of modern day psychiatry, you know, including the er erroneous etiological explanations of various disorders, the extremely quick automatic prescription of drugs that have serious adverse effects, the way in which people are misinformed or not informed about the true nature, about the mechanisms of psychiatric drugs and the dangers of long-term use. So we've paid special attention to that. And we've featured a couple of people who have their own personal stories. And I'm here with Anne Bracken today, who has your own personal story of surviving psychiatry so thank you thank you so much for joining me and thank you nick it's a pleasure to be here we have i think we've in in turning our attention to this topic we've grown an audience that is i'd say a lot of people who have their own experiences you know mm -hmm. of, of surviving psychiatry and and then also many people who are quite educated on the topic and so i think that you're speaking to an audience right now who has um, kind of the, the readiness to understand where you're coming from. And I think there will be many people who have an, a very high level of empathy for what you've gone through. And I hope that people listening are, are comforted and relieved knowing that there are others who have gone through what you're going through or what you've been through. And so I, I just appreciate so much, you know, someone like you, Anne, who is capable of telling your story in such an articulate, compelling, relatable manner. I know you've you've written your book, which is entitled Crash, a memoir of overmedication and recovery. And my first question to you is why did you write this book and also why is it relevant today okay thank you that's a great question to start with um i experienced a very severe depression beginning in 1993 and more or less ending in 1997 and then along with that I had an episode of uh, chronic pain that lasted for seven years. It was a daily chronic migraine. So I was medicated so profoundly for both conditions. And um, what happened to me, you know, I fell into the, the time period of the 90s when Prozac had just come out around 87 or 88. Uh, I had had some episodes of depression previous to that where the doctors treated it like an episode and I went on a medication. I came off a medication. They never said to me, you know, this is going to be a lifelong chronic relapsing condition. Um, it was, it was an episodic kind of thing. But when I got to the nineties, you know, they, the therapists and the doctors were all telling me that I had a chemical imbalance in my brain, that uh, it was hereditary because my mother had experienced severe depression, and that I would need drugs for the rest of my life. And no matter what I said to them, they, they couldn't hear my story. Uh, you know, no matter how I tried to talk about some of the things that were going on in my life, that was just treated almost as a, as a side issue. Like, yes, you need to go to therapy. Yes, maybe you have some problems in your marriage, but that's not what's really causing your depression. Your depression is a chemical imbalance. So that story was, you know, limiting. Um, and after a while, I, I bought it because I just couldn't keep fighting the so-called experts that I was dealing with. And I was in a very difficult marriage, raising two kids, trying to 
recover from depression and this uh, unrelenting migraine. And I, I also had to deal with, you know, my ex-husband who told me I would never get well. So long story short, after I recovered and I got divorced, I was teaching at the University of Maryland. I was teaching a course called Professional Writing, and I had several students who were doing research on the overprescription of selective serotonin uptake re-inhibitors. I had never heard of anything that they were talking about. I was completely shocked by the things they were saying about how the drugs could change the brain, how the drugs could literally flip you from um, just regular depression over into bipolar depression, how damaging the drugs could be to you. And so I thought, all right, I will investigate their source. And I, I found this book by Dr. Joseph Glenn Mullen, who was or is a psychiatrist at Harvard. He practices there and he teaches in the medical school. And I started reading the book and I thought, I am not taking these drugs anymore. I'm, I'm not willing to be anybody's experiment um, with these drugs. I, and I had been in remission for several years. So I thought, why am I doing this to myself? You know, I don't, I don't, I, and I had already seen, because my mother had severe depression from the late 50s all the way up until she died in 2002, I had already seen her suffering from tardive dyskinesia. So so when, when Glenn Mullen talked about that as an effect of the drugs, I thought, I know what that looks like. I didn't know it was neurological damage, but I thought, I don't want that to happen to me. And I... You know, so I worked with my therapist. My doctor would not approve me getting off the drugs. Um, I worked with my therapist to get off the drugs. And then in, um, so I, I just went along my life. I got rid of the migraine. I worked with an energy healer to get off of the severe um, migraine drugs, including opioids. Um, and then in 2015, I heard Sam Quinones who wrote Dreamland, talk about the genesis of the opioid epidemic. And he talked about how OxyContin was sold to doctors as a, and patients as a drug that if you used it for pain, you couldn't get addicted to it. Mm. And I thought, that's exactly what happened to me. Mm. I have to write a book about this because I had no idea that I, not only did I fall into the middle of the the use of uh, psychiatric drugs, but I fell into the use of opioids and I suffered from both of them. So I thought I need to write this book because thankfully I never became addicted to the opioids. They, I don't even remember them helping me. They didn't even make me feel good. So I wouldn't get addicted to them. Mm -hmm. But how many people are there like me that are severely over medicated to the point where they might have car accidents, mm -hmm. you know, right. and I thought this is a story that needs to be out there. So that that's why I wrote the book. And that's it's still relevant today, because all you have to do is open up a newspaper. The New York Times this fall had a huge uh, front page Sunday article about a teenage girl who was on 10 psychiatric medications. So. It's still happening to plenty of people. Yes. Well, <clears throat> thank you for writing the book, uh, for opening up, you know, so honestly about your experience. And I couldn't agree more that that it's extremely relevant today. And it's really interesting to assess the situation because part of me feels like the tides are turning. Part of me feels like, there are there's, we are on our way to the tipping point of consciousness about kind of the real nature of mm -hmm. you know what really causes um, emotional suffering and what really causes these conditions and just you know the the various levels of validity to the various disorders that are in the current DSM, which is a complex topic, but some of them definitely lack scientific validity and so the awareness of that and the awareness of what actually causes 
various conditions and the awareness of the true nature of psychiatric drugs, which is that they are just psychoactive drugs that produce a pharmacological effect. They don't heal anything. They don't correct anything. They're just drugs like alcohol is a drug, you know? Um, so I, part of me feels like we are on our way to a tipping point where enough people are going to be educated about this issue. But then there's another part of me that feels like we are going in the wrong direction. And as you, as you look, when we look at the rates of prescriptions continuing to increase over time, when you look at the, the forecast that, you know, um, like you can see the, the forecast in sales of psychiatric drugs that the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies are predicting, and of course are predicting steady raises in the profitability of these drugs. And so there's also that, and that is extremely discouraging, but I don't, you know, it's, it's not a discouragement that let that makes me any less active in my advocacy it's just it's something it just reminds me that the problem persists and that putting stories out there like yours mm -hmm. is extremely important so you mentioned you know what you were experiencing and then what you were told was causing your depression and i want to ask you kind of about that but can you paint the picture a little bit more about what you were going through when you were so depressed in the early 90s and let's start there just can can you paint the picture in a little bit more detail about your experience of depression okay um i i would say it probably started with the migraine headache which i had never in my life had i was never prone to headaches and all of a sudden one day i went out to lunch with my ex-husband and a, and a family friend, and I came home and I had this massive headache that just would not stop. And, you know, it felt like there was a piece of metal on the top of my head and it was just being pounded on the top of my head. And I thought, well, I'll go to acupuncture. I'll try that. You know, I don't know why I have this headache. So really the the journey that I was on, I believe, was that my marriage had been difficult for a very long time. Um, we had been in therapy on and off over the years. And I always had to bargain with my ex-husband, you know, like, okay, well, we'll go three times. We'll, we'll just go three times and we'll see what happens. As if three times is going to fix things. And it was, it you know, our marriage developed a pattern like a roller coaster. You know, you go up the long, long slog and then you get to the top and there's a little bit of, of fun and joy and then you're slogging again. And I guess, you know, I was 41 at the time. So I'm thinking maybe, maybe it was my body and my mind just communicating with me that you need to get out of this. But I couldn't see that. Right. I, I am a very spiritual person, though. I was in a prayer group. I was raised a Catholic. Now I'm more of a, I guess you would say, a Buddhist Catholic or Buddhist Christian mm -hmm. with a little bit of Quaker in there. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I belonged to a prayer group at the time, and my friends and I would meet at least once a month and all support each other. We were all mothers. We would go to different houses and pray and support each other. and. You know, I, I, so I had a spiritual consciousness and I, I had just read Care of the Soul by Thomas More. And it, he's a psychotherapist, used to be a priest. And he talks about depression as being in the, in the Roman times, you know, a, a kind of a journey to Saturn, a journey to the, to the cold, dark planet. And he, he also references John of the Cross, who talked about the dark night of the soul. And he mentions Dante about, um, uh, now I'm blanking, but the divine comedy about mm -hmm. how it starts where he says, I woke in the middle of my life in a dark wood. Mm -hmm. And so that was the real sense that I had. So I, I'm I'm kind of like, 
dealing with two tracks so in my in my personal life and in my mind and with my friends i'm talking about i'm going into the darkness because this is a this is a profound journey i'm not sure what's wrong but i know i'm going to get better and everybody who's telling me how to get help is giving me drugs and they're not really listening to my story what a chasm between those tracks. Right. And, and the, of course, the people who are giving you drugs come with the air of authority. They're, yeah. they're, they're the culturally sanctioned experts about the issue, which I would imagine would engender some level of kind of self-doubt, you know, when we're in that context and we're talking to someone wearing a white coat called doctor something and they're speaking with such authority i would imagine i can only imagine how difficult it was to really kind of trust your intuition in that moment yes so can you recall prior like when you were a kid when you were a teenager when you were a young woman when you were growing up did you have any kind of existing belief system about depression and what caused it all that, well, my mother suffered from postpartum depression starting, her first episode was after I was born. Mm -hmm. And then, so she got out of it. She had three more kids. My young, when she had my youngest sister, she had a very severe episode of postpartum depression and wound up in a psychiatric hospital in Baltimore for six months. So I was seven years old. I, and my dad did not tell us where our mother was. None of us knew where she was. Um, one morning, my grandmother just showed up and moved into my my little sister's bedroom. And dad said, your, your grandmother's here to take care of you. Your mother had to go away. So that was pretty traumatic. And after, at some point, we learned she was in a hospital. She started coming home for very brief Sunday visits with my father. And after about six months, she came home. So all that we knew as very young children was that mom was sick and we had to be good. <laughs> and if we were really, really good and we prayed, she would probably get better. That's that's what we knew. And as I got a little bit older, I started to hear the story about postpartum depression. And that was all that was talked about in regard to my mother was postpartum depression. And so my initial understanding as a as a child and even going into my teen years was that if you got depressed at some point, you stayed that way forever because that was my experience. My mother pretty much stayed there forever. She had periods where she would she would have some good days or some good weeks, but it was never sustained. So to me, depression was something that was terrifying, and I never wanted it to happen to me. But then it did. Yes. <laughs> and the explanation, as you said, that you were given by the doctors was that it was due to a chemical imbalance. Mm -hmm. And yet you also had this train of thought that perhaps it could be due to situational factors, such as uh and dysfunctional marriage and and so <clears throat> would you say that like to what degree did you adopt the belief that it was indeed due to a chemical imbalance I think I I was always kind of like half and half I knew I had to go on the track of following the spiritual inklings that I was having mm -hmm. but the only help that was really offered was the drugs and you know, that that's what and it the the one book that my therapist told me to read was Listening to Prozac by Peter Kramer. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know if you read that, but um, it came out in the early 90s and it was the most glowing endorsement of Prozac that you would ever want to read. I remember very clearly one of the main things he says is Prozac makes you better than well, better mm -hmm. than well. You can, you can, you know, basically re-engineer your mind, re-engineer your life. And in a way, 
that's very similar to to what some people might say about stimulant drugs, mm. you know, because they're called mind enhancing drugs and they do have those properties of intense focus and enthusiasm. So anyway, that was my, the one book that I read. And I, so I, I sort of believed it, but I kept saying to the doctors, so you mean to tell me one day I'm fine. And another day, my brain chemicals go off for no reason. And then I stay that way forever. And they said, yes. <laughs> and I said, that doesn't really make sense to me. And of course, you know, then they shut the file and give me a prescription and I'm out the door. Have you on your way. Right. Which, and it's it's just stunning to me that how, how common that experience continues to be. Yes. Sometimes when I'm talking about this whole issue with people, there's there's always a part of me that wants to give all the caveats and wants to acknowledge the psychiatrists out there who are doing good work and who wants to acknowledge the people who are benefiting from psychiatric drugs. And, and I do go, I do acknowledge that from time to time, but then there's also part of me that, that knows that I want to look back on this time and know for sure that I was one of the people who was unafraid to fiercely criticize how misguided this this whole practice is right and and I, I i just know that i will regret not being fierce enough and it's not in my personality to be a fierce critic i'm like very agreeable i'm very kind mm -hmm. i i never want to like even make people really feel uncomfortable about what they're doing but at the same time i, I have to kind of override my default mode when it comes to this issue and i have to be willing to be fierce because because so many people are being harmed currently right. they're being harmed on a biological level and they're being harmed also in much more insidious ways in that for example someone like you luckily had the you know the background enough to follow that other track of thinking and to make major changes in your life that ultimately resulted in your improvement but there are many people who don't question what they're being told at all and then right. they the insidious um detriment is that they don't end up making the changes that their emotional pain is signaling them to to make right and then they end up getting chronically stuck in situations mm -hmm. in mentalities that and and that is to me one of the one of the worst outcomes that we see aside from the biological adverse effects such as tardive dyskinesia like you mentioned your mom experienced which for people who don't know and you can please tell me what your um understanding of this is but it has a lot to do with involuntary motor movements just like smacking of the lips and yes. making kind of random facial expressions that yeah. frankly are perceived as kind of strange yes. you know and and often you know I, I know many i know many drug addicts i work in a jail i know many people who are heavily addicted to both uppers and downers legal versions and illegal versions and you know when you see a person who's smacking their lips like that and making these kind of strange facial expressions frankly it's it's difficult to take them seriously and that sounds harsh but that is the perception people tend to have and so what a what a horrible thing to do to somebody to give them a drug that is going to lead to that outcome probably if taken long enough and then kind of just turn them into a person who is not taken seriously in society because of some abnormality that is just so on display. Right. It's horrible. Completely, completely beyond their control. Yeah. When I was, you know, one of the things that happened when I was writing this book, so I wrote my story and all I could do was conjecture about why my mother never got well. And I thought, well, part of it is probably because, number one, the state of psychiatry at the time, the way that she only had male 
doctors. And so they did the therapy, such as it was, that she was Catholic and therapy, psychotherapy was very much frowned upon. So it had to be kind of hidden. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was that she self-medicated with alcohol. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, that's why she never got well. And all I could do was really tell our stories and conjecture about my mother. But as I was writing the book, my sister moved and we had to go through all of my father's files. My father had died a few years before. And when we were cleaning out her attic, um, there was a file that had 30 years worth of my father's records about my mother's illness. Interesting. And, yes. And in that file were all the answers that I was looking for. It was as if he wanted me to have this. Um, and it was, it was organized. Mm -hmm. um, there were letters that he wrote to doctors. Right on the top of the file was a letter that he wrote to one of my mother's psychiatrists explaining her whole history. And he would list all the medications. And in the first paragraph, he talked about my mother being drugged. I won't call it medicated because that has a po positive connotation. Right. Thank you. He was drugged with um, amphetamines, barbiturates, antidepressants, um, and a drug that they don't even make anymore called Dexamil that was half amphetamine and half barbiturate. So in a six week period, she was, I don't know how many concurrently, probably several, but she was given six different drugs in a six week period. And at the near the end of that period, my father writes in the letter to the doctor, even I knew that she needed to be in a hospital. So she was, she was in her early forties. She had a six month old baby. She was breastfeeding and they were giving her all those drugs. Gosh. So that was part of the answer. Then I, you know, I saw that she was taking Ritalin and I thought, Ritalin, why are they, you know, that was before I knew that that was the first, one of the very first drugs they ever gave people for depression was Ritalin. And I thought, oh, well, you're jacking her up and then you're bringing her down and then you're giving her an antidepressant on top of it. And um, no wonder she wound up in a hospital. Right. Which drugs were you prescribed? <laughs> well, let me see. They're all in the back of my book. Uh -huh. I have a whole list. Um, Ativan, Valium, Buspar, Elvil, Paxil, Nortriptyline, Zoloft, Effexor, Serzone, Wellbutrin, Lithium, Depakote, Topamax. <laughs> Um, MS cotton, oxycontin, methadone, Demerol, Percocet, and a few others. Uh, <laughs> there's a chapter in your book, I think you entitled it, If It's Not Working, Do More of It. Yes. Yes. Um, what do you mean by that? So that's that's my impression of what both my mother's doctors did to her and what my doctors did to me. So they would they would see like for example mom struggling with insomnia. So they would give her you know more sleeping pills or they would give her what was she taking? Miltown. She was taking Miltown. She took Elevil. She took Ritalin for many years which of course you would probably have a sleep problem if you're taking Ritalin. Mm -hmm. And they gave her barbiturates for years. And they never saw her get, get better, but they kept throwing drugs at her. Mm -hmm. They they did the same thing to me. You know, I they put me on an antidepressant. They'd say, I have great luck with this. This is going to work. This is going to be the one. And six weeks later, I... I'd be in there again and say, you know, this isn't working. I feel so depressed. Um, and they did the same thing. So at some point, I think it was around 97 or 95, I started getting, I started going to a headache clinic in Baltimore. And, and the first drug they gave me was Oxycontin or no MS cotton. And then they gave me Oxycontin and they were combining Oxycontin with four or five psychiatric drugs and 
a nasal spray and an injectable headache drug and nothing was working, but they still kept giving me the drugs. Um, and it, you know, I, at some point I began to feel suicidal and I was so suicidal that we, we were on vacation for our 20th anniversary and I came home and I, I just felt so horrible that I went to my psychiatrist and I said, I, I want to have ECT. And they arranged for me to go to a hospital. I had to go to this outpatient program, which I describe in the book. And I, some funny things happened, but I, I basically say, I think it was just to make money for the hospital. It, the program didn't really make any sense to me. And um, they gave me ECT. They gave me several treatments. But when I started doing my research, I realized that the drugs they were giving me were numbing me. And it's even called psychic numbing. And part of the reason that I felt suicidal is because I kept telling the doctors, I can't feel anything. Mm. I can look at life. It's like I'm in a glass booth and I'm looking at life, but I can't touch it and mm. nothing touches me. And I thought, God, this, you know, I just, if I can't feel anything, why do I, why do I want to be alive? Mm. And I did want to live. Of course I wanted to live because when I was 14, my mother tried to commit suicide and it was devastating to me. And I had always promised myself that I would never do that to my children, but it became a daily struggle for a long time. Mm. I have so much compassion for your former self in that moment and for everyone who is listening to this and relating to it on a very personal, immediate level, because I know those listeners are out there. And right. I hope that, you know, just by listening to you speak and people watching on YouTube can see you. Some people are watching on other streaming platforms and can only hear us right now. But, you know, you you look, you're a beautiful woman, you're articulate, you look healthy. So I hope that you represent hope for people and that you represent um, that it is possible to get through all of this, to get better and to live uh, without the 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 hazard of drugs every day um i that's my hope that's really why i wrote the book because as i as i began digging into the research i started discovering the term polypharmacy mm. realizing that i had experienced that and how common it was and i thought i I am not alone in this story. It happened to my mother in the 60s. It happened to me in the 90s and 2000s. It's still, I have friends, many friends that it's happening to. And I thought, how many other people feel suicidal and they don't even know that it could be the drugs that they're taking right. that are causing those awful awful suicidal feelings and then to dig into the research and find that the drugs only work for maybe 30 percent of the people so that leaves 70 at least 70 percent of us that are getting no benefit but we're we're getting the very negative effects right. of the drugs so that's kind of where i come from it's like so i grew up seeing somebody really damaged by drugs and never wanted to go in that direction and so it was difficult for me to take all this medication and somehow believe that I was going to get well and not need it anymore. But, you know, I can I can look around and, and see people that are taking all these drugs and nobody's telling them, you know, they haven't been studied altogether. You know, maybe you feel maybe you feel um, numb because of the drugs. The information is out there. But you really have to look for it. I, I feel like it's siloed. You know, I feel like if you read the New York Times, you get one story and the Washington Post, kind of the mainstream media, you get one story. And unless you move over to, and I'm going to just plug Mad in America because I think they do such a remarkable job of posting research and featuring research. Unless you're reading in that realm, you might not 
discover these things. It's true. You're right. And just to make sure people heard, you know, what you just said, the plug, Mad in America. I, I know many of our listeners are aware of the website and um, the book, Mad in America, written by Robert Whitaker, who was a guest on this podcast. I think it was our fifth episode. And yeah, I couldn't agree more that that's such a fantastic resource. I think the book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, might be one of the best go-to resources if you really want to get a clear sense of the historical evolution of psychiatric drugs and then the the evidence that we have for their for their effects for their right. positive and negative effects and what's interesting too so i want two things i want to make sure to ask you about your experience of ect which in case people don't know stands for electroconvulsive so-called therapy and um but right before i ask you about that i just wanted to make a comment that it's it's always interesting to me when we talk about the percentage of people who are benefiting from psychiatric drugs and the percentage of people who are not just to look at those percentages it's extremely alarming to see the the rate of people who are primarily experiencing the adverse effects yeah. uh it's alarming and then also though when you look at the percentage of people who are benefiting and for whom it's working we really always i think have to ask the question what exactly do we mean by working what exactly are the advantages of this and often what we realize is that for the person to say that it's working they just mean that they feel better than they did before they started taking the drug but that doesn't mean that the person is completely flourishing it doesn't mean that the person is actualizing their potential that they are at their best, that their mind is sharp, that their faculties are completely online and fully functional and reliable. It doesn't mean that they are as healthy as can be. It never means that. And so I always think that that's important to point out. And, and while I know that there are people listening right now who currently have this drug, you know, exerting its effects in their brain as they listen. And I'm not trying to make a person feel ashamed of that at all. Like, I agree, we should never pill shame, as they say. Um, but I just think it's so important to understand the true nature of, of what's happening, which is that there's a drug in your system. And um, I think that the best we could say about the benefits of these drugs is that they might heighten the floor but they also lower the ceiling on your well-being. And I understand if people are in just complete despair and just paralyzing depression or overwhelming anxiety, some type of pharma pharmaceutical agent that's going to heighten the floor on that and make you feel not quite so horrible, I see why that's appealing and I see why people do that. And I support people using chemical support to kind of heighten the floor of their well-being. But the it's really problematic. And what people I think don't realize is just how much it also lowers the ceiling, just how much it limits how often they'll belly laugh, just how much it li limits the, the sharpness of their mental faculties and, and how much it'll limit how good of a mood they really can experience, how fulfilled they'll feel, how rich life will feel, how sensitive they'll be to the beauty of life and things like that. So I just, I always feel like it's very important to point that out, that even when we acknowledge the advantages of psychiatric drugs, we have to qualify that by saying that it's not that good. You know, <laughs> they're not, they're not going to make you like all those things I just described, completely flourishing. Right. Well, but, but I understand I, that it's better than what you've been going through. And I get that. I think the other thing is that, you know, for, I'm, I wanted, when I was trying to sell this book to agents, I had to really try and convince them um, that there was a market for the book. Mm -hmm. And what I came up with was the percentage of people that the drugs work for. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, the audience is people like me. The audience is people that try drug after drug after drug, and they get no relief. And they feel worse and worse and worse over a period of time. That's the audience that we're that I'm trying to reach and say, you know, maybe there's another way. Maybe there's maybe 
maybe you could consider this. I, I don't want to try and give answers to anybody because not everybody can manage to find their way, you know, find another way besides the pharmaceutical way. But, but if you're not being helped by it, maybe my story and some of the research that I provide could help you right. start to invest, start to investigate it for yourself. Right, right. Well, did your book get picked up by a publishing agency? No, I myself published it. Which is it's just so interesting. I mean, honestly, your argument is very strong. And if we're strictly thinking in a business manner, these publishing companies are are missing out on profit. I mean, there really is an appetite for these types of books. And I think that appetite is growing quickly. I, um, well, I think so. But I, what, what I notice, see, when you write a proposal to sell a book, I don't know. If, I don't think you have a book. that you sell. OK, so you have to write a proposal and you have to find comparable books, books that are like yours and then give the sales figures. So the books that I found were all people who had experienced depression and who were still on the drugs. So they were they were like, yes. You know, I went through a terrible depression, but now I'm taking Paxil and Paxil is one. So so they were very pro drug. Mm -hmm. I found there's only a few. Brooke Siam is one. I haven't read her book, but I know she wrote a book in the vein, in the same vein as mine about coming off of psychiatric drugs. But there there just aren't that many. Mm -hmm. There's one about schizophrenia called The Collected Schizophrenia and it won an award. And um, she's very pro-drug and she, you know, she, she alludes to this traumatic incident and shortly thereafter, she started experiencing psychotic symptoms, but she never, she never makes the link. I don't, I, I got the sense in reading her book that she couldn't make the link herself mm. or she didn't want to make the link, but mm. in the book, she doesn't make the link. Interesting. Yeah. Well, we'll see how that changes over time. But that that is an interesting. I, I appreciate you sharing all that. I didn't quite have that perspective, you know, on kind of the the common ground of the types of books that are like this and just how much they are pro drug. Because I, I do, you know, have to check myself and ask that question. Like when I was talking about my my impression that things are getting better that may be a result of being in somewhat of an echo chamber and and f being in communities that are in this conversation but if i zoom out a little bit i might it might be um eye opening just that and, and it might it might kind of support that other feeling i have of like things are moving in the wrong direction but anyway i will stay optimistic and hopeful and i want to go back more into the details of your story i mentioned i was going to ask the question of what your experience of ECT was like. So can you describe that? Like, what is that process like? What does it feel like? Are you conscious while it's happening? What are the effects of it? Oh, well, thank God you're not conscious while it's happening. Um, I think in the beginning, in the 30s, people were conscious. And I, according to some of the research I've done in India, they still sometimes practice it without anesthesia. But they need a whole team of people to hold the person's body down and restrict them and everything else. The process, uh, you go to a hospital. I was an outpatient. And my doctor did a process where you would, you would give anesthesia and you would do four shocks. So I had seven treatments, which would equal 28 distinct treatments. And I just... I chose that because I thought there's no way I can keep going and going and going. It was so anxiety producing. And I was just starting to write at the time, just starting to find my voice as a writer. And I thought, I don't want to, I don't want to lose my memory because I saw my mother lose a lot of her memory. And so you go to a hospital, you get dressed in the clothes, they take you into the operating room. Um, they wrap your, your, one of your legs in a tourniquet so they can, um, 
they give you a muscle paralyzer, but they want to monitor the seizure. And one of the ways they monitor the seizure is by looking at your toes. And that's why they put a tourniquet on your leg. Hmm. Um, and after they give you that sedation, you just wake up in the recovery room and you, you're kind of in a fog and you, at least I did, I had a headache on top of the other headache I already had. Hmm. So I had a post ECT headache. Hmm. And then, they, well, before ECT, they give you a memory test because they want to have a baseline. So it's kind of silly stuff like, count backwards from a hundred by seven and take this piece of paper and put it on the floor and then pick it up and draw a house. I mean, it's a really weird test. And then they give you that after you have the ECT and I guess they compare how your memory is, but for whatever that's worth, mm -hmm. I don't know what it really shows. But how it, out, how spread out were the seven different treatments of four shocks over over a couple of years mm -hmm. yeah and what effects did you notice i didn't notice a whole lot there would be times when i felt really good but again it was very short-lived and i was still on all the psychiatric drugs yeah and one time i had a treatment and I slept for a whole week afterwards. And I thought that I was just so depressed that I was sleeping. But as I now I wonder, and I think it's possible that I had some kind of brain trauma because excessive sleeping can be a sign of, of brain trauma. And it would make sense in a so-called treatment like that um, with four shocks that I would have possibly have brain trauma. Right. And I see how <clears throat> when there are so many factors affecting you when you're on multiple drugs and you're doing that treatment that it becomes impossible to determine what the effect of any one of those variables is anymore, just because it's this kind of storm of factors. Um, yeah, wow, so interesting. So then can you take us to that the time period when you started coming off the drugs and when you started feeling better and can you highlight what 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 were the most important things for you to get better oh my goodness um what which getting better like getting better mm -hmm. out of depression or getting better getting off the drugs good question so <laughs> Remind us of like the, the timeline. Okay. Like so when it, by, from 93 to 97, I experienced depression and I took all the drugs that I read to you a few minutes ago mm -hmm. and had several treatments of electroconvulsive therapy. I also had one inpatient hospitalization and one outpatient hospitalization. And I remember at some point in 97, I began to feel good and just stay there. I didn't relapse. I didn't go back down. And at that point, I knew that I wanted to get out of my marriage. But I still had the severe migraine and I knew I couldn't work. So I kept trying to heal the headache and kept trying to do things to to heal the headache. And by 2000, in January of 2000, I had a car accident on um, Route 70, which is an expressway. And I swerved across the road five times and crashed into a guardrail. And um, I, I fell asleep, obviously. And I was terrified that I could have hurt somebody, but I didn't. I didn't hurt anybody. I hurt the car a little bit. And I was okay. So I just went on about my life and I, th I just kind of tucked it away. I really was in denial about this car accident. And a few weeks later, I was driving through the city. I used to volunteer at Hopkins in Baltimore and I, my, I was going to visit my parents and I was driving through the city and it was a very warm January afternoon. The car was filled with sunshine. The heat was on and I woke up, crashed into the back, crashed into the back of a van and woke up with an airbag in my chest. 
So that accident I didn't ignore. Um, that's the one that where I went home that night and called an energy healer because my friend had told me that the energy healer was the most profound healing she'd ever had. And, and I knew at that after two accidents, I knew that Western medicine was not helping my headache and that I could have killed somebody. And I didn't want to be that person like the, the proverbial drunk who kills somebody, but they walk out of the car. I didn't want to be that person. So I started working with an energy healer in January of 2000. And by May of 2000, she had me off of all the headache medicine. And the pain was gone. Wow. And yes, I and I wasn't keeping a journal at that time. I wish I had because my memory is foggy for exactly what process we went through. I know I worked with my headache doctor because I was on methadone at the time, oral mm -hmm. uh, pills, methadone. And I know I worked with that doctor to cut that drug down. But all the rest of it is kind of a blur. And so there, once I got rid of the headache pain, there was one more incident of verbal abuse with my ex-husband, and I just knew the marriage was over. And then things started improving, making these major changes to your circumstances, relieved of the headaches. And then at what point did you start tapering and coming off of psychiatric drugs? That was when I, it was 2002 when I was teaching at Maryland and my students started researching mm -hmm. over prescription of SSRIs. And I read Glenn Mullen's book and just said, I'm, I'm not taking these anymore. And, you know, I, I worked with my therapist. I got off the drugs. I went to see my psychiatrist and I tried to talk to him about Glenn Mullen's book and he completely shut me down. Mm -hmm. He said he'd never heard of him that I wasn't taking Prozac anyway. So what was I worried about? That Prozac was a good drug. He used it with lots of people. And that I should, I, I also write poetry. He said, well, you should just stick to writing poetry and let me stick to the drugs. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's my body and it's my life and I'm not willing to do this anymore. And he said, well, you have a damaged brain and if you stop taking drugs, you'll be sicker than you've ever been before. Oh, my God. And I said, yeah, a damaged brain. I should have said thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I thought, no, I don't have a damaged brain. I'm fine. And I'm walking away from this. And I, I said, okay, you know, if I ever get depressed again, I'll have to figure out what to do. But I'm not taking these drugs anymore. That's incredible. And it's interesting to kind of hear <clears throat> the difference, like how defensive the psychiatrist got, yes. which is understandable, like the level of dissonance that was brought up uh, for that person in that moment, I assume was extreme, given how many people he had probably prescribed drugs to. Um, and defensiveness is one of the most common ways we deal with that type of dissonance and challenge to our ways uh but then you know i think there are some people who would have gotten defensive in your position when your students were writing those papers i think i admire that you didn't get defensive and perhaps that's because there was always a part of you that questioned it um but i do think that many people in that position might have gotten defensive in that moment and and just been desperate to justify to themselves that no, I'm doing the right thing. There must be something wrong with my students' research. But no, you were really open to it and 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 allowed that to inform your decision making, which I really respect. So then, did you choose to taper down over time? Did you kind of stop abruptly? What did that look like? No, I didn't. I didn't stop abruptly. I I was the one. Let's see, I was the one. Well, Butrin, Topamax, Elevil, and Valium. Four drugs. Drugs, yes. And for maintenance. Mm -hmm. So I I started with the, I remember starting with the one that was the newest, which was Topamax, and getting off of that one, and then getting off of Wellbutrin. And I was only taking Valium 
occasionally. So I really wasn't worried about that drug. I wasn't taking a lot of it and I wasn't taking it every day. The Elevel was the hardest drug to get off of. And I, I didn't get off of that one for about another five years because every time I tried to get off of it, I got a massive headache. And, you know, in in that time period, 2002 to 2007, the internet was so much newer and there weren't a lot of support groups, at least I wasn't aware of any, but I did start to do research and start looking into maybe discontinuing Elevil or something. And I found this support page mm. where people talked about headache as a rebound effect of stopping the drug or a withdrawal effect of stopping the drug. And so I had an acupuncturist at the time who was also a nurse and I talked to her and she said, look, just come off of it a whole lot more slowly. So I don't even remember how much I was taking, but it was it was a very low amount. But I still had to come off of it practically like shaving the pills um, and over many months, maybe even as long as a year to get off of a, a fairly low dose of the drug. Mm. And then once you were drug free, how did your life begin to change? How did your emotional patterns begin to change? How did your well-being begin to improve? I I think I saw myself in a different way, you know, I and now I'm very fiercely on the side of not describing myself ever as mentally ill. I don't ever consider anybody who experiences depression or anxiety or even psychosis as really being ill. I think it's a response to some kind of life situation or some kind of trauma that you've had. And um, I don't want to limit myself by, by labeling myself as a mentally ill person. I just that that bothers me to label anybody in that way because I think you're diminishing them. You know, I have a background of of being a special education teacher, and I never wanted to describe my students by their so-called disability. I started out as a speech therapist. I would never refer to a student as a stutterer or an articulation problem. Mm. Um, and I don't think it's fair to refer to some of the older students I taught as, you know, um, a, a learning disabled person because they're, you're so much more than mm. whatever that label is. Yeah. You know, you maybe you're a person experiencing right. a learning disability. I like to say I experienced depression and that that kind of distances it from me instead yeah. of saying I was depressed. Right. It's I experienced it just like I continue to experience anxiety at times, but I really see that as very normal, yeah. normal part of, of life in this world that, that we have to learn to manage. Mm. Well said. I, I, I think that's a very powerful, if subtle shift in our framework of our self-concept <clears throat> that it's very important I, I couldn't agree more you know the difference between i am depressed and i am experiencing depression semantically is not that different but experientially is quite different yes. um so I, I appreciate you know you highlighting that and i think that is the healthiest way to see yourself and and you know, one of my one of my favorite quotes um, is what the Indian philosopher Jiddu Krishnamurti said when he, he said, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. I've, I've always really contemplated that, that, you know, because in, on, on, in the converse, it's it's no it's it's not a sign that you're unwell if you're maladjusted to a sick society and you don't have you can think of it in terms of society at large or you can also think of it in terms of a more local situation like for example if you're in an abusive situation and you're chronically anxious there is nothing wrong with you there's right. something quite right about you it is a, an appropriate adaptive response 
-hmm. to a very problematic situation. And I think that in many cases, you can you, you can apply this to a person's experience of depression or anxiety, whether you want to zoom into their local circumstances in the household or their school or their work or their broader society. Mm -hmm. And then and then I, I also think like when it comes to trying to figure out why people experience these forms of emotional pain, it's quite complex, of course. And, and sometimes there may very well be biological causes. But what I think is so interesting is how how um, how significantly progress has been halted in discovering biological contributing factors to our emotional pain and our, our mental kind of maladaptive tendencies. There may very well be biological contributing factors, but we have stopped looking for them because of the chemical imbalance narrative. And that is such a unfortunate outcome. Um, but then, of course, sometimes there are really not biological contributors. And sometimes it's very much so social situations or more kind of personal psychological issues, whether that be unresolved trauma or the adoption of self-sabotaging tendencies or whatever it may be. So anyway, that's just kind of some of my commentary. But what I really want to say is just thank you for sharing your story and for writing about it. And it's so helpful that you have this ability to kind of analyze the current situation we are in in terms of like mental health care from this place of having experienced it personally and having experienced your mom go through it and really your story is on the more extreme side like to have so many different drugs prescribed to you yes it's quite extreme um it is it, and yeah. and the the notion that there's you know the doctors are still doing this they're right. uh, i'm older i'm 70 and so when i read about older people or people on medicare getting over prescribed drugs it's very personal to me right. and i just you know the the one tool that i discovered in researching the book that has been invaluable is at at a website called drugs.com they upload all the um information packets from prescription drugs and they have what they call an interaction checker mm -hmm. so you can load in all the drugs that you're taking and they will tell you what possible negative interactions there can be. Invaluable. Invaluable. Now, I have friends that are on a number of psychiatric drugs and they know how I feel and some of them don't want to talk about it with right. me. And I just say, you're on your own journey. I support you in your journey. And you might want to think about taking a look at drugs.com. If you have any questions, it's mm -hmm. there. And, that, and then I just have to leave it. You know, I'm, I worry about some of the drugs that I know that they're taking, but there's also the chance that they'll be okay. And it's not my, not my business to tell other people how they want to manage, you know, their, their use of pharmaceuticals. Mm, I think that's a very grounded, wise approach, especially if you don't want to lose friends. <laughs> Because honestly, I, I think there are many people who would just begin to kind of avoid anybody who's constantly making them question everything that they're doing. So I think that's that's wise. And then people will ask when they when they're seeking advice. Mm -hmm. um, and th this is probably a good reminder for for many of us who are listening in here and who are informed about everything we've been talking about, you know, all, all the issues we're raising, that the impulse can be to kind of go around and, and proselytize this message and, and make sure that everyone knows just how dangerous these drugs are. And I get that impulse completely, but it is also important to respect people's decision making and to know that people are not going to be receptive to someone who's just preaching constantly or who's making anyone feel ashamed about what they're doing 
um, or who's in any way condescending as mm -hmm. they talk about this. So hopefully, you know, hopefully we are coming across in the right way that we respect people's personal decision making and that we are not condescending anyone who chooses to take an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety drug. Um, but we are just, you know, trying to be informative and just talk about, you know, some of the facts and and encourage critical thinking. Well, what I talk about with some of my friends and some of them have literally never, they don't know what informed consent is. They've never heard of it. Um, so I, that then when I explain it to them, it makes sense, mm. but that it's a jump though, to get from understanding it and thinking it's a good idea to getting, getting a doctor to do it, mm. especially a psychiatrist. Right. But there, I have found forms online from the American Psychiatric Association, and I've found different hospitals that have forms that, you know, you're supposed to go through this whole process with patients and give them all this information. I don't know anybody that it's happened to. I, mm -hmm. I sincerely hope that it's happening to many people. But informed consent is something that I would like to promote and right. you know and then if you know okay you're you're going to take this drug and maybe it'll make you feel numb it might make you feel better and but it might also make you feel numb then if you start to feel numb you don't think it's you mm -hmm. you recognize that oh maybe it's this drug that i'm taking and then you could be more proactive such a great point such a great point and and wherever that protocol is being broken, which might be many places, uh, the protocol of informed consent that you described and, and the form, the checklist of things that a person needs to be informed about when they begin taking a drug, wherever that protocol is being broken, should, hopefully, uh, hopefully that gets exposed. And and what a what a what a terrible act of kind of medical malpractice to fail to provide the information so that a person can consent from an informed place. I, I have no tolerance for that. It's just unacceptable because it's true that we as a culture instill so much trust in our doctor. Trust, trust with the doctor is one of the just kind of programming that we adopt early and often i think in american culture and so many people are going to completely trust the doctor and and won't even necessarily you know the, they'll not only trust what the doctor says but assume that the doctor is already going to tell them everything they need to know and so they won't necessarily ask all the questions that are important to ask and so for any doctor who is not providing the relevant information you are essentially in effect doing something or yeah doing something against someone's consent if they can't give consent so again I, i'm always like like i said earlier it's it's just interesting to observe myself because i'm such an agreeable person who likes to get along with everybody and is uncomfortable with making people feel uncomfortable and that is not the personality profile of a fierce advocate about a certain injustice, but I have to apply the knowledge that I have about this topic in this way by being a fierce advocate and by being willing to, to say things that might sound bold and being willing to kind of call out any individual who any prescribing physician who is practicing in this irresponsible way. Right. I, I totally agree. I to, I think doctors, but first of all, people have to know that they can ask for this, sure. you know, and especially when you're, when you're experiencing a severe depression or profound anxiety, you're so vulnerable. You're not at your best. You're not at your strongest. You, it, it's like you're lost out in the middle of the ocean and you just want a lifeboat. And that doctor is offering you a lifeboat. Mm. They also have to tell you, you know, well, you're going to have to row a little bit with this right. boat, or maybe it's only going to last for mm. six days or whatever. 
you know, they, they have to tell you the other piece of the story. Mm-hmm. And I, I start to wonder how much do doctors really hear that they, they're supposed to be giving informed consent? How much do they hear it? Or do they, does it just go in one ear and out the other? I don't, I, I really don't know. It's a good, valid question. Yeah. It's, yeah, lately I've, I've really been thinking a lot about like how, what will his, what, what will history say about this time period and, and this dominant approach um, to dealing with mental health issues and it's, I do not think this is going to be a favorable analysis. Right. In decades from now, when we look back on this, I would never, I would never go as far to say that taking a psychiatric drug is as bad as getting a lobotomy. But I would go as far to say, as bold as this may sound, that the problem is as bad. Because although it's not probably as damaging to the brain as a lobotomy, it's so incredibly widespread. We have one in five people in the United States taking a psychiatric drug. That's so many millions of people. Yes. And that, therefore, given how widespread it is, although the actual treatment is not as severely damaging, I think the problem is on par with yeah. lobotomies. And we look back on lobotomies now and cringe in our souls that we did that to people. And I do believe that in decades from now, we will look back on this moment and cringe in our souls when we realize that we were drugging children and drugging old folks for decades at the end of their life and and doing so just in an absolutely reckless manner. Yes, I, I agree. And I, I have several friends who have um, either children or grandchildren who have experienced psychiatric issues and who are hospitalized and immediately medicated. Mm. And I I really can't say anything. Um, I, I have talked about informed consent, you know, as as one of the things that you that you're entitled to as far as giving your child a drug. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, people are so desperate, they're vulnerable. These kids are are in a lot of pain. Some of them are harming themselves. And you know, we we know other treatments work, but we don't have a lot of places that offer the other treatments. So that's the bind I find myself in. I, how can I advocate for something that barely exists at this right. point? It's a great point. It's a great point. Because if you're going to highlight a problem, we should also be offering a solution. And yeah, when I when I think about that, I mean, there are many layers of, of solutions, I think, uh, to offer to address our kind of mental health crisis. Um, But I guess I know we're kind of nearing the end of our conversation, but I did want to ask you, like, how would you compare the benefits of therapy to the effects of drug treatment? And I didn't catch whether you said, I I did catch that your therapist was fairly pro-drug, right? Like your pair. A a couple of them were, yes. You've had some different ones, yeah. I had several. I would fire people. I would fire people when I started to really disagree with them. But I had one who was a social worker that I saw for several years. I had one who was a psychiatric nurse that I saw for a couple of years. And my my last therapist was actually a regular social worker with a background in poetry therapy. And I didn't mention this, but it's in the book that poetry therapy is one of the one of the doors that that opened my my realization of what was really going on in my life mm. was the idea of the dark night of the soul of um, learning about poems by Mary Oliver about the, the poem, the journey and the wild geese about a dark night and it's wild and you're out on the road, but you have to leave because you're saving the only life that you can save. And I thought, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm saving the only life I could save for whatever reason. I'm here and I'm on this dark road and I I just have to go. And so this I I just after I got out of 
depression, I actually started studying poetry therapy and got training to be a poetry therapist. And one of the therapists I worked with had also been through the program. So she was she was skilled in both worlds, in the world with regular therapy and some medication management and then poetry therapy. Mm-hmm. So she was very supportive. She was my last therapist who was Beautiful. very supportive. And then, yeah. Yeah. So therapy was a mixed bag. Um, no, but I think more people use it now. More people use cognitive behavioral therapy. But actually a friend told me about the book Feeling Good by David Burns. And that helped me almost more than anything Mm. to undo very negative thought patterns. Mm. And then more recently, I started having some, I guess you would call it PTSD from the car crashes. I I just would freak out just about being on the expressway and think my car was going to fall apart or I was going to hit all these other cars. And I couldn't, you know, I, I just... I be, I began to feel paralyzed with driving. And so I, I worked with a therapist on um, EMDR, the eye movement, rapid eye movement desensitization. And she was very good too. Mm. I feel like it's, it's important that I say that obviously neither of us here are giving medical advice. Right. And I can see how someone would listen to this conversation and then begin to consider coming off of a psychiatric drug. And so I want to make sure that I offer resources for how to do that very safely, because it can be done in an unsafe manner, which is typically like when a person does it abruptly and without any kind of support. So I just want to mention to listeners that there are a couple people who have provided uh, important resources, one of whom is the famous Peter Bregan, um, a psychiatrist who has been one of the most outspoken critics of our time about psychiatry and has written books about exactly how to come off of psychiatric drugs safely. So Peter Bregan has I don't know that he would be available personally to guide people through that, but his books will. There's also Joanna Moncrief. Uh, yes. Again, I don't know what the status of her meeting with clients is and if she is taking on clients or anything, but she's also written books like um, uh, The Bitterest Pill is one of them, and she has other books as well, and she's been a guest on this podcast. That's another resource for people who are considering coming off of a psychiatric drug. And then Kendra Campbell, who is uh, also a psychiatrist, was also a guest on this podcast. And last I checked, is currently accepting clients and has now turned her specialty, in her turned her practice into specializing in helping people withdraw off of psychiatric drugs. And so I just want to mention those three names because again, obviously a conversation like this might lead someone to start considering um, coming off of a drug. And so those are good resources for people to look into. You know, if, if they want to do it. I have several in, right. listed in my book as well. Beautiful. Um, one of them is the Inner Compass uh, Initiative, and they have support groups, online support groups, and they have tons of information mm. about, about discontinuing psychiatric drugs. And then Mad in America website on their resource page, if you want to look for a doctor or a therapist, you can, Mm -hmm. and they list them by state. So there are several doctors in, at least in Maryland, I'll just say Maryland and California, because I know for sure that there are several psychiatrists who are considered holistic, and they will work with people in discontinuing medication. Excellent. Thank you for mentioning that. Well, are there any last words that you'd like to share, perhaps especially for the people who can relate on a personal level to your story? Keep keep moving forward and believe in yourself. Um, you can get well, no matter what anybody tells you, you are not limited by someone else's opinion of what your situation is. And, you know, be kind to yourself. Just really learn how to be kind to yourself. And I I think that that can help with a lot of um, very negative feelings that we often experience. It it just just seems to me when people, when people talk about being ashamed of mental illness, I think to myself, well, 
what's what's so abnormal about feeling anxious when you've just experienced a three year worldwide pandemic mm-hmm. and everybody's life has changed? Mm-hmm. What's abnormal about that? Why should anybody feel ashamed about that? Why should you feel ashamed if you're a kid and your parents get divorced? Or your parents fight all the time and you don't have anybody to talk to. So you start feeling really sad and you don't want to play with anybody. You know, that's that's a pretty normal response for a kid to have. So I think, you know, we need to we need to like place this in the context of real life that all these things are normal. We're full human beings. We can't just zoom through life and never, you know, experience any of the the bumps. And I think that's what sometimes depression and anxiety are. They're they're just bumps in our lives. Beautiful. (laughs) Beautiful. I'll mention again, I'll plug your book, which again is called Crash, a memoir of over medication and recovery. Uh, I know that People can purchase the book, I assume, on on various websites. Is there any particular place you'd recommend people go to get um, that? Bookshop, you can buy it at bookshop.org. And when you buy the book there, you you are, have the opportunity to support local bookstores through the sale of my book or any other book you want to buy. Excellent. It's available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. It's also available on my website at www dot and bracken author.com excellent well and thank you for your time thank you for sharing your story i'm so glad we are connected and i trust we'll stay connected from here on out this has been an, a, an important conversation thank you it was You're awesome. welcome. well we'll cut the video at that point Hey, and I have to share something with you. Please. You said you work in a prison, and I don't uh, think I don't think I told you this, but I wrote a book about working in a prison. No way. It's called Once You're Inside Poems Exploring Incarceration. And the artwork is done by an incarcerated, a formerly incarcerated woman. No way. Yeah. Yeah. So for three years I volunteered at a a men's and women's prison in Maryland. And I was so, I was so overwhelmed by what I saw and the stories that I heard. I thought I have to tell these stories. Mm. I, so I started writing poetry. Po- I wrote poetry as a way to, to like process the, the overwhelming awfulness of the prison. And that's when I started learning about, you know, the, um, the damaging sentencing and all these men I was meeting, they were in their thirties and they'd spent half their lives in prison. You know, I, I, I come from a background of being a teacher and I thought, if you can't help somebody in 15 years, you just can't help. Them. So why are they still, why are they still here? They were so hungry as students. They were some of the best students I ever had. I, yep. And um, so I, I wrote the book. Incredible. Yeah. I'll have to read that as well. And even even having spoken to you already, I, I still will read Crash. Um, oh, good. Yeah, good. I, yeah, I think you'll like it. I, I, I think, think so too. I think you'll like the book. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about it. This is, I think, this is an urgent topic. You know, I feel um, like you were saying about where are we in the world of psychiatry is it hopeful or not hopeful Mm -hmm. i get very upset when i read about um ketamine clinics Mm -hmm. you know where where, and people the new york times had an article last week where you can buy ketamine online from from some provider somewhere you know which number one you don't even know if you're getting ketamine right (laughs) certainly nobody's monitoring you and Gosh. You know, I, I just think that's really wrong. And I think so. I, I love Michael Pollan. I love what he says about food, but I think he's done a snow job on this on the um, psychedelics. I don't I, I just don't think it's as neat and tidy as it's being presented to everybody. I think that's that's a good analysis. There's no panacea. You know, right. like I don't have an answer. I have what worked for me. Right. I have what worked for me. 
I, and I've seen it work for other people, right. but it doesn't work for everybody. So I understand wanting pain relief, you know, and if a psych, if a guided psychedelic experience in a safe place can help you, then I think it's fine. But I, I don't know how many are going to be guided or safe, how expensive it's going to be. There, there is no one answer to this question. You're absolutely right about that. And, and even when we do find, let's say there is some psychedelic that has no damaging effects on your body and it relieves you of your condition, there's still the potential problem that whatever, if the depression, let's say, was caused by some something that's wrong with society, then if we just alleviate the depression, whatever's wrong with society will continue to be wrong. We'll never address it. Right. So that, that's another issue I see with kind of any any treatment that just alleviates the symptom without uprooting the cause. Right. I do, I, I'm, you know, I, I do think fondly of some of the psychedelics, but I don't think they're the panacea. I, I completely agree with that. And I also see that potential problem of just basically, I don't think the solution is just make people feel better. Right. It's not. Deeper, yeah. And, you know, when you read about the studies, the st at least the ones I've read about, they're, they're two therapists with a person for eight hours. Now, how much is that going to cost? Right. And what insurance company is going to pay <laughs> for that? That's not the way it's going to get scaled up. Right. You're absolutely right about that. I, you know, this, I, I, and I put Robert Whitaker up on a big pedestal. I, I am so impressed with his work and all that he's done. And I so appreciate the way he has explained clinical trials, mm. how they work and how they're, they're, um, what do you call it? Um, run badly, basically. Mm. I mean, there is a better word. I can't think of it right now, but yeah. how they, they reconfigure them to get the results they right. want. And right. I, I never would have done this deep dive if I hadn't been writing this book. Not many people do a deep dive like this. And, and what you said earlier that if you don't do the deep dive, you may never get any exposure to this perspective. Like, like you said, it is siloed. Yes. And it's, I think it's very easy for a person to just never really hear any, any criticisms like this. Right. Or, or, you know, that I, I wrote a, um, there was a, an editorial in the Baltimore Sun, which is Baltimore's newspaper. And it was by three psychiatrists who were criticizing the practice of using psychiatric hospitals as places of horror at Halloween. Okay. But they they said, you know, how good that ECT was so benign and that we had all these good treatments. And I just thought, no, you don't. You don't have all this good treatment. All right. Right. So I wrote, I wrote a response and I incorporated a lot of research refuting their points. Well, the Baltimore Sun printed it Good and they you. printed it as a feature piece. Yes. Wow. On a Saturday. I was so surprised. And then immediately three psychiatrists refuted what I had to say. And guess who one of them was? Ronald Pies. I've heard of him. Yep. Oh, my God. And he's the one who says. We never said that we believed in the chemical imbalance theory. And I quoted him and he denied, he denied ever saying that. And then I thought, good, I have gotten bottom pies <laughs> <laughs> to answer something. So then I wrote, I just wrote a very short answer to the psychiatrist and said, all I said was, I appreciate your response. Um, I would encourage you to listen to the stories of many patients. Because there is there is more than one way to to wellness, mm. and the sun printed that. So awesome! I was pretty lucky to get all that, you know, to get it out there as a yeah. As a, yeah. That good for them for printing it. Good for you for writing it. That that's that's exciting and and it's you know I would imagine that there's some level of like intimidation that you have to overcome. You know going back and forth with three doctors on a certain topic like that's courageous of you i admire that thank you i just i just thought 
You know, I knew I, I anticipated a negative response, but I anticipated a negative response from patients. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think psychiatrists and certainly not Ronald Pies of all people. He must right. have a Google alert for his name. I don't know. So <laughs> um, what was the other thing? Oh, I know. Have you ever heard of the Justice Arts Coalition? No, I have not. So I volunteer with them as what they call a correspondent. And I write to people in prison who are artists. Uh, and so you, I will send you information because some of the people that you work with might have work that they want to share. Thank you. Please do. Yeah, they're a wonderful organization. They're right here in, in Maryland. Okay. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm always... It's funny because um, you kind of, one of my early impressions of you was that you reminded me of a woman that works at the community college where I teach. And she also, she taught creative writing in a jail. Um, oh, God. Yeah, you're kind of the same type of people. And um, and so anyway, she she really brought out and gave the inmates um an opportunity to like publish their poetry and their art and it and and i remember they had like a poetry reading and invited people like it was a bunch of staff members from the college where i teach who came and listened and it was very powerful i'm sure and yeah so so any outlet i think i'd be happy to share with them so please i, I just googled it right now but still please do send me information about this what a positive movement they ha and they do art exhibits that people can send in their art and then Justice Arts Coalition gets a little gallery mm -hmm. and exhibits their artwork. And I've been to a couple of them and what they do that's so wonderful is they have a notebook by each person's work mm -hmm. and you can respond to that person. They encourage you to write to them and then they send these notebooks to the people in prison. It it's so affirming. Yes. Wow. So yeah, they're, they're a wonderful organization. Wow. Okay. Very happy you put that on my radar. <laughs> okay. Well, it was great talking with you. Likewise. Um, we'll be in touch. I'll, I'll send you the link to this once we publish it, probably next week. So okay. you'll hear from me soon. Okay. Thanks a lot, Nick. You're welcome, man. Yeah. Bye.